Well, let's look at all of these stories now. Harrison Griffiths is a political commentator who joins me on the line to do just that. Very good morning to you, Harrison. Morning, Rosie. Thanks for having me on. No worries. Let's start with the front page of The Guardian, if we can. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit on this programme. It is a significant shift in the Church of England. So now same-sex couples can get a blessing for their union. But it, it's caused lots of controversy, hasn't it? It certainly has. Uh, this is the latest in a series of long-running debates within the Church of England between progressives and conservatives about their particular attitudes towards same-sex couples and while you know i think everybody who supports the fight for equal marriage and equal protections under the law for everybody should be happy to see uh progress being made uh within the church of england uh, i do understand to some extent the frustration of some conservatives who believe that you know the centuries old tradition in the church uh, that marriage is between a man and a woman is being undermined. Um, nonetheless, uh, it wasn't just the discussions about blessing same-sex marriages that sort of took place. The Synod also voted to try and uh, fight against uh, the oppression of uh, LGBTQ people uh, across the world more broadly. And while the question of marriage in particular is a thorny one in the church, I am very happy to see that they are pretty committed now to ensuring that everybody is sort of welcomed into the church regardless of their exact doctrines on who ought to be blessed and who ought to be married so it's definitely more of a step forward but i, I do understand the frustrations on both sides really and it's been a really raw debate. I mean, lots of the, the papers have got photographs at that vote took place and uh, people have got sort of anguished expressions. Some people are crying. Um, so uh, clearly that's been a, a, a story that's caused pain, as you say there, on, on both sides of the debate. Let's move on to the front page of The Telegraph, if we can. And this is about the, the ongoing discussion in Scotland about what happens in its prisons. And the headline here is Scottish prisons scrap gender self-identity. What's the change here? Well, it looks as though after um, the attempt to push forward reforms that would make it easier a few weeks ago in the Scottish Parliament to uh, basically uh, make, make it easier for people to uh, self-identify and get gender recognition certificates that could potentially have led to more people um, who self-identified as uh, female being put into women's prisons. Uh, it looks as though we're seeing the full reversal of that policy from the Scottish Government after that attempt to legislate was blocked by the UK Parliament. Uh, and I think uh, having uh, individuals placed in prisons in particular based on their sex characteristics is probably a sensible move at the moment, particularly in light of what happened with uh, Isla Bryson a few weeks ago. We have a, a rather unpleasant individual uh, seeming to transition during the particular case, which raises obvious safeguarding issues. So while it's a conversation worth having, it seems, uh, in prisons in particular, with the safeguarding issues thereof, I think it's a, a sensible way forward to just put a pause on all this and really step back and consider exactly how the safeguarding of female prisoners can be upheld uh, while trying to sort of ensure a safer, more equal environment for trans people broadly. Yeah, it's hugely complex. Uh, in an announcement yesterday, uh, the SNP government said newly convicted or remanded transgender prisoners will be placed in an establishment which aligns with their gender at birth. This is another story that's going to cause, um, you know, significant controversy. Let's move on uh, to something else uh, and a deeply uh, difficult story. I'm looking in The Guardian now, page five, and uh, the problem that the police have had in trying to investigate the disappearance of Nicola Bully, and they found that there's been real problems from people turning up, maybe people speculating on social media, creating their own content about uh, why she went missing, and police have now been granted extra powers to remove social media influencers from the scene uh, where she went missing. What, what do you make of this decision? Do you think it is clear from the police's action that these people who are trying to help may have been hindering the police's ability to investigate? Absolutely. Um, it seems that a handful of these people are 
earnest in their attempts to try and help this is a quite mysterious and very tragic case that seems to have gripped people's imaginations. But nonetheless, uh, when the police do cordon areas off and begin to investigate, they must sort of uphold the sanctity of the crime scene in a way to help them best get to the truth. And however noble your intentions to try and help, um, often you can hinder it. And I am glad to see that the police have been given more powers basically to stop that so that it doesn't compromise the evidence taking them in the direction of the truth. Uh, for some of these people who seem to be trying to take advantage of it, social media clout, I mean, I'm completely flabbergasted by that. Um, uh, I can't understand, particularly you know, given the really quite sort of sad circumstance around this, you know, she has a family, children, um, why you would go anywhere near this crime scene to try and, and boost yourself personally. Um, but I'm so glad to see the police have got a grip on it. Um, and I hope that it, this yeah, anybody who's going in compromising a crime scene potentially is dealt with pretty swiftly. Yeah, a dispersal order was put in place um, on Wednesday night, so anyone taking photos and video for social media um, can be can be sent away. Obviously, people have got questions, and as you said, it may be in in earnest, but if it's hindering uh, the investigation, clearly it needs to be uh, it needs to be stopped. So the police have new powers to do that. And we have we have seen stuff like this before, usually outside courtrooms in particular, when people are you know making a song and dance about the procedures of uh, investigating, charging, and uh, and actual court cases that uh, they have uh, that court cases have often been compromised, uh, despite the best intentions of people trying to draw more attention to the particular case. So it's definitely better to err on the safe side from the police's perspective. Let's move on, shall we? In the mail now, and, and this sort of rings true with a conversation that I had with a friend very recently who's um, just got a new job and was saying, I don't know where to live in between changing jobs. Maybe I should go home for a period of time. And the hotel of mum and dad, it turns out that lots of people have checked in. Five million grown-up children are still living at home. Clearly, uh, the cost of living plays a part in this. But are you surprised by the number of people who said, actually, you know, staying with mum and dad seems to be the sensible solution? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. It, it seems as though, you know, with almost five million people, uh, five million children now living with their parents, that it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, the article mentions the cost of accommodation um, during COVID and people sort of missing out on the student experience. But it is also part of a long running saga that we just don't have enough houses and that getting on the housing ladder and even renting is becoming unaffordable, particularly in London and the Southeast for so many young people. Now, that, you know, the flip side of this is that it is very normal um, in a lot of Western countries, particularly in Southern and Eastern Europe, to have multi-generational households. Um, and uh, sort of moving away from this very individualistic, if forgive the term, idea that people should you know, get out of the house as soon as possible and go and make their own way may not actually necessarily be a bad thing. Many people are happier at home, but... Would your parents have you back? Well, I'm not sure really, but, you know... I'm always, always happy to. Um, but you know, <laughs> this, this is the problem. Some some parents would absolutely love and relish the idea that their uh, young adult wants to live with them. But for others, you know, this is a time maybe they're looking forward to retirement, different lifestyle choices. Uh, they probably didn't anticipate having to look after uh, some people in their 20s or even in their 30s. So if you're a parent this morning, uh, how would you feel if uh, your children came to check in you can text me 8722 start your message with the word times harrison let's look to um jeremy clarkson if we can and uh, the telegraph are reporting on this the watchdog are going to investigate this this column that he wrote about Meghan markle which he did apologize for realizing he totally just got the mood totally totally wrong and what he said wasn't appropriate is an investigation required no, I, I don't think so. I'm not sure that the regulator can cast 
any light on what's happened that somebody wouldn't have already known from having read the piece. It was, it certainly overstepped the line. It, some of the language he used was pretty repugnant, I'd say. But everybody knows that. There was uh, an outcry from almost all quarters. The piece was withdrawn and they, the sign attempted to scrub it from the record. Uh, uh, the biggest problem from my standpoint is just this incessant need for regulators and legislators to get involved in every single aspect of our lives. The story has been withdrawn. He has apologised profusely, but I think the, the key lesson here is it never seems to be uh, enough for certain segments who are always out for sort of vengeance in this sense. So while the story was absolutely grim, uh, I don't really see what more needs to be done or said about it, given that it's been withdrawn and he's apologised. I think in part it was down to the sheer volume of complaints that were made. Um, we'll mm. see how that plays out. Harrison. 25,000. 25,000, yeah. Remember. Thank you very much for joining me to go through the papers this morning. Harrison Griffiths, political commentator, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.